Peace be with you. Good morning and welcome to uh, chapel. This week we gather during Holy Week as we remember Jesus moving from this festival parade of palms toward the cross, uh, toward Easter. So we're grateful this morning that Dr. Simeon Pickard is here to share with us, professor of chemistry, chair of the chemistry department. We have a couple more opportunities for CCS credit uh, tonight, FCA. Uh, there will be uh, an opportunity to receive credit next Wednesday, uh, another opportunity. Next Wednesday, we will also uh, gather together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. I hope you'll uh, be there, be there, be here um, next week. I invite you to stand as uh, we prepare for worship. A passage I've come back to a few times in the past couple of weeks and one that's appropriate for Holy Week from Psalm 130, verses 5 through 6. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning, or for some of us who wait for the end of the semester, perhaps. Let's pray. Holy God, by your power, may we, with all of the saints, comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Jesus Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that we may be filled with your fullness. Amen. sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began was redeemed only beauty remains my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began my chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he faithfully bore he canceled my debt and he called me his friend when death was arrested and my Make 
than my life began. You may be seated. God promises that if we confess our sin, we will be forgiven. And in being forgiven, we find the grace to forgive others as well. So now, in humility and in faith, let us confess those things that where those places where we have failed uh, to God. Let us pray. Lord, you know that we find ourselves in these patterns or cycles that are difficult to break. We feel betrayed and then we feel pain that we cling to. We cling to that pain and refuse to forgive. And then refusing to forgive, we find ourselves pushing away from others, living in fear. And then living in fear, we find it difficult to move beyond ourselves to love others, to serve others, to care for them as you have cared for us. Forgive us, Lord. Give us the courage to forgive so that we may be free. Give us hearts that long to serve you in that freedom and to serve your world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. Through Christ, we are forgiven. Through Christ, we are given the grace to forgive. Through Christ, we are made whole. Through Christ, we are at peace. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see each of you here this morning on Holy Week. All right, I was asked to speak this morning. Uh, I have a burden on my heart um, that may be relevant to you too. Okay. I'll begin with Psalm 55, verses 1, verses 6 through 8. The psalmist said, I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert, Selah. I would hurry to my place of shelter, far from the tempest and storm. This beautiful little piece of poetry is set in a psalm which otherwise seems to be seething with turmoil. But perhaps that was the psalmist's point. He was saying that his life right then was filled with turmoil like a terrible storm, and he just wanted to fly away to a place of safety and peace. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt like you were caught in a storm and you just wanted to get away from it all? I have. Perhaps there is something inside of each of us that desires to flee from the storms of life, even though in our heart of hearts we know that's the wrong thing to do. I have wondered if perhaps we have those thoughts because deep down inside we sense that we were created for a world of storms and turmoil, not for a world of storms and turmoil, but rather for a world of peace and security. But be that as it may, we all know that storms are a part of this life, and running away is not going to solve anything. I think the psalmist knew that too. The storms of life are called by many different names in the Bible. Trials, tribulations, hardship, suffering, to name a few. And these storms come across our path in many different forms. Sometimes they involve our finances. Other times our health, maybe our marriage, our children, our job, or perhaps the death of a loved one. For many of us, it seems that at one time or another, we have experienced storms in just about every form they can take. And like the psalmist, we want to cry out, Oh, how I wish I had the wings of a dove and I could fly to a place of shelter far, far from this storm. But I believe we need to face life's storms head on. And in that spirit, I would like us to spend a few minutes today and look at some important storms in the Bible. 
I cannot look at all the storms that, that are mentioned in the Bible, but I would look, like to look at at least three. And these three will serve as examples of different kinds of storms that come into our life. And I hope that as we do that, that we might learn a lesson there too. Storm number one, the storm we bring upon ourselves. This is the kind of storm which results from sinful or willful decisions on our part. And in general, we are simply reaping what we sowed. Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. This is the proverbist's way of saying, God wants the best for us. We can trust him. But too often we think we know better than God or that God doesn't really understand our situation. So we willfully or foolishly take our own path and it leads us into a storm of trouble and heartache. An example of this type of storm is found in the book of Jonah. It is surprising to me that Jonah would bring such a storm upon himself. After all, he was a prophet. You would think that of all people, a prophet would know better. Even so, God dealt with him very patiently, and that should give us hope. Surely God will deal with us patiently too. Let's look at Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went on board and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to their own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. What a great storm that must have been, that even experienced sailors feared for their lives. We know they feared for their lives, not so much because they cried out to their gods, most people will do that in a moment of trouble. But these hardened sailors threw their cargo overboard. That was their very source of income. Truly, this must have been a terrific storm. But this storm was not about them. Even though God used it for their good in the end, this storm was really about Jonah. Jonah had brought this storm upon himself because he ran from God. I wonder how many of us have brought storms into our lives because we didn't obey God or because we didn't trust God or because we didn't seek God's wisdom when we came to a fork in the road thinking that we knew what was best for our lives. Like Jonah, I have to plead guilty. But also like Jonah, God, who is incredibly patient, eventually brought me back around to his will. And for that, I am truly grateful. Yet in between time, I had to weather a time of emotional storm and with it a darkness almost as dark as if I were in the belly of a great fish. I am wiser for having lived through that whole experience, no doubt. But the lesson came at great cost of much wasted time and many, many tears. And quite honestly, I don't want to ever go back there. Of all the storms that sweep across us, I think that this kind of storm must be the worst because we had the most power and opportunity to avoid it, but we didn't. Storm number two, the storm that others bring into our lives. Paul experienced this kind of storm when he was a prisoner on his way to Rome. We find this recorded in Acts 27, beginning in verse 13, where Luke records the experience. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Kata, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. 
And when the men had hoisted aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Syrtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. If you remember this story, Paul had warned them not to sail from Crete because it was too late in the year. But the centurion, the Roman soldier in charge, who had the final say, listened to the captain rather than to Paul. The storm was in no way Paul's fault, but Paul was caught up in it nonetheless. It had a happy ending, for only the ship and its cargo was lost. All lives were saved. But there was great suffering and great distress experienced by all, including that man of God. This kind of storm also finds its parallel in our lives today. It might be that a boss makes some bad management decision which results in layoffs and we become unemployed. It could be that a spouse makes some very bad choices which brings a catastrophe to our marriage. Or perhaps most common of all, a child becomes a prodigal and heaps untold grief upon the parents. These are not our doing, but the pain and the grief are no less real. It is in times like this that we need to remember that God is always with us, and that he is able to take care of us, and most of all, that he has always been faithful to us in the past, and we can trust him this time too. Storm number three. This is the storm that God himself sends our way. We read about this kind of storm in Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. That day when evening came, he, meaning Jesus, said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up and rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why were you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and they asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. I am convinced that in this story of Jesus calming the storm on the sea of, of the Sea of Galilee is an example of a storm of God's own making. Jesus had instructed his disciples to head for the other shore when suddenly a great storm showed up. Now some people would argue that Jesus didn't know this storm was approaching and it was just by chance. But to me that sounds incongruous with several other stories about Jesus and what he knew. For example, he knew that a colt would be tied up in the next village that he could use to ride in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He seemed to know that a Samaritan woman with a bad reputation was going to draw water from Jacob's well in the middle of the day. And apparently, he knew that in Jericho, a short tax collector named Zacchaeus would climb a tree in order to get a glimpse of him. I believe he also knew that storm was coming up but he sent his disciples into that storm anyway. Frankly, I think this was such a great opportunity for an object lesson that he couldn't pass it up. After all, Jesus was the consummate teacher. Sure, it would be a hardship for his disciples, but he wasn't going to let them sink. Jesus was going to be right there with them the whole time, just like he is right there with us in the middle of our storms too. Immediately, the question may come to mind, why would our Heavenly Father allow storms to come into the lives of His children in the first place? Well, of course, I can't answer that question for everyone, but I can offer my experience. 
in my life, God has used and continues to use the storms of life to teach me how to pray. Too often, I'm afraid that my prayers must sound to God something like this. Blah, 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 blah. In Jesus' name, amen. It's not that those prayers are insincere. They're sincere, but where is the earnestness? Where is the depth of heart or the brokenness in those prayers? The Bible says he is the rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. When those disciples in that storm came to Jesus for help, their request may have lacked faith, but there was no lack of earnestness. They were deadly earnest. Likewise, when I have cried out to God in the midst of my storms, there was no lack of earnestness there either. God may use storms in your life in different ways but I feel sure he uses them to bring about good in your life too. The writer of Hebrews said it this way, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. Now, to bring this to a close, all storms, whatever their source, surely only come to us by God's permission. We live in a fallen, imperfect world, and even though a lot of seemingly random stuff happens to us, God is still in control. If we will walk with him, I believe he will measure out those storms carefully and use them for his glory and our good. So when the storms come, and like the psalmist, we want to fly away to a place of shelter, that's okay. I said, that's okay. But just remember one thing. That place of shelter is not a physical place. It is a spiritual one. We need to draw near to our God, draw near to our Good Shepherd, who will comfort us and care for us even as we travel through the dark valley or into the terrible storm. Thank you. I invite you to stand as we affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Please pray with me. Almighty God, during this Holy Week, as we remember that Jesus took upon himself the sins of the world, we pray that we might be given the grace to accept the suffering and the burdens of our brothers and sisters around the world as our own. As Jesus looked at the city of Jerusalem and wept, so we pray for the nations and the neighborhoods in which we live. We pray for nations that worship power, and might. May they be ruled by humility and peace. We pray this morning for the people of Ukraine and for the resolution of this conflict. We pray for victims of human tragedies and natural disasters. We pray for those who are in prison, for the repentant, 
the unrepentant, for those falsely accused. We pray for those who are sick. Bring healing. For those who grieve, comfort. By your grace, help us to live into that new life you have given us, to be more faithful disciples of your son Jesus, and to follow more fully in his way. Hear us as we join together in the prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This last song says, the grace of God is glorious. I would invite you to stand because you've been sitting for a while as we sing this last song. shown for all to see perfection bore our penalty with the grace so glorious immortal day the veil was torn when mercy dawned a crown of thorns as law gave way to liberty and freedom for humanity with the grace so glorious and know the glory of the Savior's love surrounding us surrender to know forever we are welcomed home crowned in glory to glory worthy is the Lord of all the glory forever holy is the Lord crowned the 
Savior's love Surrounding our surrender To know forever we are welcomed home So crowned in of him who ransomed me I fall in worship at his feet and rise to reign eternally in a grace so glorious Go now with courage and confidence to face whatever storms there may be ahead of you, knowing that you are not alone. The Lord is with you. And as you go, may the grace and the mercy and the peace of our Lord be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>